Willie Tyler is a ventriloquist who, along with his partner Lester, has been making a living in show business since the 1960s when he was hired as the MC for Motown's Motor City Review. He joined the cast of Rowan and Martin's Laugh-In in 1972 and has appeared in countless TV shows, commercials, and films ever since. He's open for such heavy hitters as Sammy Davis Jr., Anne Margaret, Gladys Knight and the Pips, and Frank Sinatra. Willie Tyler is a legend, and he is my guest on this episode of Under the Puppet. You're listening to Saturday Morning Media, and now, back to our show. Welcome to the show that is preserving puppetry through the personal stories of professional puppeteers. My name is Grant Pachoco, and this is Under the Puppet. Well, Willie Tyler, thank you so much for being here on Under the Puppet. Thank you, Grant. My pleasure. Um, do you remember your first exposure to puppetry or ventriloquism? Well, I first seen um, a gentleman by the name of Paul Winchell mm-hmm. on TV. He had a weekly television show at that time. And what happened is like um, uh, we had a black TV, black and white TV back in those days with the with the rabbit ears. Some people don't know what the rabbit ears. There's <laughs> that little antenna on top. Uh, so um, I'd seen this show. He had a weekly show, and I'd watched Jerry Mahoney and Knucklehead Smith, and I, I I was fascinated on how he made the characters come to life. So a few days, a few weeks later, I uh, I just took my sister's discarded doll and and did a, a, a MacGyver with it with a coping saw and a and a rubber band and a string, and I made the mouth move, and I, I used that until I was able to buy a, 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 a store-bought Jerry Mahoney. Wow, that's interesting. And did you, when at that young age, did you have any resources to teach you ventriloquism, or were you just, you know, just copying what you saw on TV? I was just trying to emulate what uh, Paul Winchell was doing, and what I would do when I went to school. We had, they had talent, weekly talent shows in school, elementary school at that time. And my teacher, she saw that I was really interested in that. And I went to, I was in the, in the library and I saw an ad in Popular Mechanics magazine. It said, learn ventriloquism. It's the mayor school of ventriloquism. The mayor school of ventriloquism was outside of Detroit. It was right out, it's a national magazine, but it was, it was located outside of Detroit in a place called Gross Point Woods. And uh, so my teacher, she saw, I was so interested and I showed her the ad and she, I really remember Miss Thelma Baldwin. I know we'll forget her. She took, she drove me out there. She drove me to the school and uh, we, I met uh, Madeline Mayer, who was uh, Fred Mayer's uh, widow, uh, who was a ventriloquist, popular ventriloquist. And um, so I got the, I got a correspondence course, you know, for, for $35, you know, I got the correspondence course and, uh, and, uh, and uh, a Jerry Mahoney figure with the, with the course. And and that's how you just started teaching yourself using that uh, correspondence course, right? I was trying to do it on my own, you know, trying to do it, but I got the course and they gave. She sent me uh, uh, every two weeks. I would get a, a particular course, a little a lesson, and mm-hmm. uh, and she had a thing called the Ventrilo Aid. I mean, it was a little plastic thing. You couldn't put it all the way in your mouth. It, 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 it couldn't go in your mouth because that, that's a that's a safety thing. But it was like you, you just bite down like a harmonica, mm-hmm. but it was like, it was a plastic. It was plastic and you could see through it and it had holes in it and you bite down on it and then you say, oh, yeah, you know, that kind of thing. And that's um, th- that's how it all began. Yeah. And uh, growing up, was your family creative at all? No, actually uh, not in showbiz. No, my, my dad, he worked uh, with Ford Motor Company in Detroit uh, and he was a mechanic and, and that. And, uh, and I, I come from a family of 10. And nobody else, well, except my brother Henry. I think he's a, he's a, well, he's a DJ in in Detroit. Uh, but uh, other folks, they weren't in the in the show business at all. They dabbled in it. My brother would be with a singing group for a while and stuff like that. Yeah, I was going to ask because you in your act, you've done a lot of singing. Did you have any singing training, or did it just come naturally to you? I I, I learned that from uh, when I was in school. I had uh, vocal vocal in in the high school. Mm-hmm. And then I, I sort of learned how to how to this hold a note or stay in key there. But then later on, when I went in the service, got out of the service and went back to Detroit, and that's when I got with Motown. When I got with Motown as the MC, Lester and I would MC the shows in the Motortown Review. Mm-hmm. And I would always go on. I would always introduce the acts and go off in the wings and wait till they finished and go back and go back out and introduce the next act. But I would notice when I was in the wings. The, the audience, I look out at the audience and I saw how they were enjoying the singing. 
And I was enjoying the singing. I said, hey, that's pretty good. Uh, they, they enjoyed it. So maybe I'll put a, a song in the act. Yeah. So I started putting uh, music in, in the act. Uh, not, I didn't do it that much with Motown because they had people that had hit hit records and stuff. <laughs> they didn't want to hear songs that I, I didn't have a hit record. So, But when I would uh, go off and do shows and, in different venues, I would I, I put the songs in. And when we started doing television, I put the songs in. Think about a time when you're down and out and feeling sad. When you are so young, you want to be so old, that's not bad. What goes around, comes around again. What goes around, comes around again. You developed uh, Lester at a very early age. Did you ever develop any other characters besides Lester or was Lester just it? And that's what you stuck with. It was like when I first started. It was like I, I was trying. I was trying to get a character, and I finally I got I got the character from character from uh, Madeline Mayer, and uh, I, I got him home. And I couldn't I couldn't think of a name. I, I I would come home from school every day, and I'd sit him in a corner, and I'd stand back, and I said, "What does he look like? What can I call him? What can I call him?" And my brother Delano he came in one day, and he said, "Hey, I got it." He said, "I got it. Name him Lester." There's a guy in study hall. His name is Lester, and he, he looks just like him. <laughs> so the Lester came into being. Now I tried to add other another other characters. Mm-hmm. I bought a character one time from from Madeline Mayer, and I never used it you know, because uh, it, it it just sat there, and I don't know where it's at now. But I never used it, and it was like a situation where I said I put all the energies into uh, Lester, so to make his c- character more lifelike because that way people won't get him mixed up with other other people, so this, they know that Lester is Lester. Right, right. Well, you mentioned the Air Force. Were you able to keep performing while you were in the Air Force? I was in the Air Force as a as a recreational specialist, so I was able to entertain uh, all the time I was in. I was in four years, and uh, all the time I, I I was in there, I was able to entertain and would be in talent contests and stuff like that. We won some awards in the talent contests, oh. which was good, you know. Yeah. So it's good that you were able to to keep keep honing those skills during that time. Yeah. When I went down to the recruiters, recruiters office, I mean, when you still, when they're down you're downtown in the federal building in Detroit, you go down there and they type up stuff on you. They type up uh, the, the guys that type in a whole bunch of stuff and they're asking you questions and stuff. And they said, what would you want to be? What, what would you look forward to in the air force? And I said, well, I'm a Ventura. I showed him a picture of Lester, Lester and I, he says, Oh, Ventura. he says, Oh, okay. He just shrugged his shoulders and kept typing. You know, and uh, he said, we can't guarantee you anything. I said, I, you know, okay. But then later on when basic training, that's when I was able to get in, get uh, transferred over to uh, being a recreational specialist. Oh, that's incredible. That's great. Um, and you mentioned that after, uh, you said earlier that when you, after you left the Air Force is when you hooked up with Motown. And I read in an interview when you were talking about those shows that you said that uh, people would, you would, sometimes you would just use shows back to back to back and people would watch multiple shows. And that kind of forced you to to write new material and to come up with new things for different. Well, ad lib, ad lib, yeah, you had to ad lib because you couldn't. It, it, yeah, but to be specific, it was like the Apollo Theater, Apollo right. Theater in, in New York, which is like a, a lot. Even people with records, when they had a record and they were going to appear at the Apollo Theater, they were sweating because the audience they didn't take any guff. You know, right. if they didn't like you, if they didn't like your song whatever they let you know you know kind of situation so we're trying to do comedy is a different thing so again when it was when the uh when the days were slow where they didn't empty the theater and bring new audiences in some kids would stay and they would know the punchlines to your stuff so what you had to do is add you had to add lib and you know it wasn't a big long act it was a couple of minutes you know right. in between uh each each uh, act and uh, and I tried to make it as short as possible, more than maybe thirty seconds, because I didn't want to be out there. Because they would they would they would they would say, uh, "Hey, where's the act? Where's the music?" You know, one of those right. things. So I, you know, I didn't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to hear that. So I just wanted to get get out there, introduce the act, and get off again. Right, right. Um, and you also, with the Motown Review, you went out and you traveled and you toured and you played a lot of different um, venues. What did you learn by going out and playing so many shows in all these different places? 
Well, it was like, uh, it was, it was, it was, it wasn't work. It was a lot of fun because you were with the, it's like the Motown was like the Motown family. You were with people that you, that you knew. The band traveled on the bus. You know, it was, it was all self-contained. It was a self-contained kind of situation. Stevie Wonder was traveling, little Stevie Wonder, but he didn't travel on the bus. He traveled with his tutor and his driver uh, in, a, in a station wagon because he had all his keyboards and all this other stuff in there. And every time he got to, we got checked into a motel, you can see him unloading the keyboards and stuff and taking them in the room. He was getting ready. He was back in those days. He was working on things, songs like uh, My Sharia More, you know, which was, yeah. came came eventually, you know, all those right. classics. Yeah, yeah. It's so amazing. Um, and in, in 1969, you played the Copacabana with The Temptations. And then again in 1970 with The Four Tops. How amazing was it to get to perform at this legendary venue? That was a lot of fun. It was like, you know, what happens like before when I knew I knew I was going to work the Apollo, I mean, the uh, the Copa. But what happened was like uh, I was saying, wow, the, the, the Copa. Wow. But when we got there for like uh, rehearsal, you know, you rehearsed like in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. So we went, I went, we went in there, and it was a small place. It's downstairs. You go in and you go downstairs and it was, it was down downstairs. And it was like a situation where I went in. It was a small little place. It was smaller. And, you know, it's like doing a TV show. And you figure you could do the TV show and it's TV show on TV is real big when you right. get it's real small. It's real small. And the uh, the stage, the stage it wasn't it wasn't the only thing that was written was up in the air was elevated was the uh, band behind. But the act itself, we were on floor level right on the floor level and the tables, they had different tiers of uh, uh, tables because it was like a restaurant, but people ate and stuff. So it was like two levels of going up, but the act itself was on the flat floor, you know, and, um, but it was fun. It was a fun kind of situation. It was classy. It was a fun yeah. kind of a fun kind of deal. I really loved that. Yeah. Well, over the years, you've performed with so many legends, uh, Sammy Davis Jr., Frank Sinatra, and Margaret, just to name a few. What is it about your act with Lester that makes you such a good opening act for these big these big names? Well, it's a situation where, um, I, you know, back in those days, I was doing, I started doing a, the, uh, a show, a TV show called The Mike Douglas Show. And then I did some more shows, same producers, uh, the, the Merv Griffin Show. And I would do those particular uh, shows and uh, from that the uh, uh, other performers saw me on there on that show mm -hmm. or the agents would recommend them seeing me on that show and that's how I was able I was able to get with them and again it was like a situation where it wasn't I wasn't uh, uh, it wasn't like a conflict you know with the, right. Lester and I we, it wasn't a conflict as opposed to another singer coming out singing songs and and then the, the singer comes comes out. I remember, uh, this, is, this is another aside, I was working with Eddie Rabbit in some place in Texas and uh, we were backstage and he came, he came in and then uh, he, he he said, hi. And I said, hey, how you doing? And, and then he, he kind of frowned and he said, uh, then I, I, I was, and he, he, he had his ears like he was listening. And what happened was like, they were playing his music. They were playing his music over the, uh, over the, um, the speakers. Mm -hmm. And you, you don't play the, the headliner's music over the speaker because <laughs> you're going to be hearing them the next night. I mean, that right. night, you're going to be hearing them that night. So you went out and said, hey, you got to cut that off. You got to cut that <laughs> off. So that was funny to me. Yeah, yeah. Well, and over the years, you've been on a lot of uh, television shows like Laughing and Lola Falana specials. And um, since Lester is such a well-defined character, when you would do a show like that, were you involved in the writing process of the material you would be doing? No, I didn't. There was a, uh, the guy, Bob, Bob, Bob Einstein, Bob Einstein. Oh yeah. Uh, Super Dave Oz one. He, right. you know, he, and his brother was, um, uh, Albert yeah. Brooks, right? Yeah. 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 Albert Brooks, yeah. So you no, know, he was a writer. He was a writer. Bob Einstein was the writer, producer, one of the writers and producers. They wrote those, they wrote that skit. You know, but what happened was like uh, we would throw little things in, like when uh, Lester came out of the back seat, he says, "Oh, my leg, my leg, my leg, man, my leg." You know, that that's, that was us. You know. Did you say what I think you said? I didn't say nothing. He never says anything in a the dry. Then he's not coordinated enough to grope and talk at the same time. Lester, <laughs> who is this? So little brother Lester, he's always sneaking in where he's not supposed to be. Come here. Hey, look, my leg, man, my leg. <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute. 
Well, you've been on uh, TV and done commercials and you've performed thousands of times live. Do you have a preference for performing on for TV and film or performing live? No, as long, as long as I'm performing. Right. You know, it's, it's, it's just the idea. You know, like uh, entertainers, you know, entertainers don't really retire. You know, if you're doing live performances, if you notice that people who are doing live performances, like being on Broadway, acting or whatever, or singing or whatever, because it's like a, it's like a situation where you uh, you feel good. You get ready. To, when you go out there, the lights come up and you get the, the reaction from the crowd, be it good or be it bad, you get the reaction from it, and it makes you, it makes you feel good when you come off. That's right. why when you're sitting around and you're not doing anything, it's like you go nuts. <laughs> right. Like now, during this pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I read in an interview that there was a time where you were opening for Sammy Davis Jr. in Lake Tahoe, and you got an, uh, an audition in L.A., but then coming back, Lester kind of didn't make the flight or didn't make it back. Yeah, it was a situation where uh, up at, we're working with Horace, working at Horace with Sammy Davis Jr. And uh, it was the wintertime and it was in Lake Tahoe. And, you know, my, my manager then, he called me, he said, uh, I got an, an interview for a commercial. I think you will we'll get this, but you got to come, you come, got to come in tomorrow, you know, fly in and you can fly back, you know, in the afternoon in time for the shows. And I was very reluctant. I said, "Well, okay, I'll I'll do it." Anyway, I flew to to, to L.A. and I did the um, the uh, interview, and then I went back to the airport. And back in those days, I used to check Lester's body, you know, I used to check his bod. And then I used to his head was in a suitcase, low, low, no, uh, overnight case under the seat in front of him, uh, down by my feet. And um, so I flew back, got back to Reno because we had to fly into Reno to get to Tahoe. You had to drive from Reno to Tahoe. So I, I landed, got out, went to baggage claim, and I'm waiting for the uh, luggage to come around. And then I uh, saw the air, airplane that dropped us off, taking off. And then I, but the, the, the carousel stopped and it was nothing. And I went over to baggage claim people. And I says, uh, I had a bag. He's, they said, oh yeah, you know, we know where it's at. It's, it's, in, it's at LA, it'll be, it'll be here in the next flight. Now this is like 4.30 in the afternoon. I said, what time is the next flight? coming back here, coming here from LA. She said, oh, it'll be eight o'clock tonight. The first show in Tahoe is eight o'clock <laughs> that night. So right away, I knew I'm in trouble. So anyway, I called uh, Sammy's people and uh, I told them what the situation was. And she says, well, okay, well, get up here as soon as you can. So what happened, if, it, if that had happened, if that happened, I'm glad it happened with Sammy because what happened that particular night, the audience that he had was uh, employees night. It was like a Horace employees night. And what he did, he did my time. He did his time. He took requests. And he was in hog heaven. heaven. That was great for him. Because <laughs> up there, you can't really, even the headliners couldn't do, a, they could only do an X amount of time. You couldn't do a long amount of time. But he right. got the extra, he got the extra 15 minutes that I would have had. So anyway, I finally got up there. I went back to his dressing room. And I didn't know what to say. But, you know, I don't know what to say. You know, I go in and this and uh, Shirley is, is girl Friday. I call her, or Lady Friday now. I guess you would call her. But as uh, she says, he's in there. He's back there. He's back in the trip. Back there. Go. He's back there. So I went in and I didn't know what I was going to say. You know, I walked in just as I was, was going to say something. I don't know what I was going to say, but he said, "Hey, don't worry about it. This happened to me. No big deal." You know, but he was he had fun that night because he was able to do it a lot more time. Right. And he, he's great at ad living. He loves to do spontaneous stuff. And that, that gave him the opportunity to do it that night. But every night after that, he'd come to my dress room and says, you got the head, you got the body, <laughs> you got the, you know, and jest, you know. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's so amazing. Um, your your act is, it's not really blue at all. You you kind of maybe do an innuendo here or there, but uh, you you don't work blue. And was that just a decision that you made? Like, we're not going to, uh, you know, Lester and I are going to be clean. Yeah, well, I, it's just I, I feel comfortable doing it that way. I couldn't, I can I couldn't do. I grew up. See, I used to in Detroit when when I we weren't on out on, on on the road with Motown. I would work at local clubs, and one of the local clubs there was a, a, a strip jump called a Brass Rail, strip on, and they they needed comics to work back because it was the Union House, and they had a trio playing for the dancers. The trio had to take a break three times a night. So the comic would do 15 minutes or 30 minutes, what 30 minutes while the while the trio took the break. So I did that. And and um and you know, in a in a strip 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 club, people don't want to hear comics. 
you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was, they were throwing pennies on the stage and stuff like that, you know, and the kind of situation. But even the comics, the regular comics that worked there, back in those days, you could not, you can't, could not say expletives. Back in, back in, a, if you said an expletive, expletive, you got fired. You know, yeah. like so so I'm just basically being from the old school. I just learned from I I, I felt comfortable doing it that way, and I, I and and I don't have any problem with that. I mean, you got yeah. people, you got some people who they can do that, and that's their thing. You know, but that's not not my thing. Right. I also feel that when you when you keep it clean or you know pretty clean, you also open yourself up to a wider audience too, of people who can enjoy your your material. Yeah, yeah. It's like it's a situation. If it's funny, it's funny. It's sometimes if something's really dirty or, or vulgar, it can be funny. It can be funny, right. but but uh, it's just uh, you got stuff you can be. People can be funny doing dirty stuff, like some comics, like Richard Pryor. He but he wasn't really no no he he wasn't really dirty. Uh, it's like as opposed to some comics I've seen, I've heard, but it's like um, it's a different kind of situation. You got a G rated, you got an R rated, you got an X rated kind of situation. You can do right. do it that way. Well, for many years, Lester's arms didn't move, and uh, you you both even joked about that in your set. But now you sort of have this mech where he can move his arms. Was that something you kind of always wanted to do, and then were able to put into him? Yeah, my brother, my brother came up with that that idea. We were in the garage one time, and we were trying to get. Get one arm to move, so uh, but he was able to uh, uh, Jerry rig all the stuff that he had. He's got a lot of tools in his garage and stuff, so uh, he was able to uh, come up with come up with that. And that was uh, I thank him for that. Yeah, it really adds a, a lot of character to him mm-hmm. when he's able little, to his little personality, yeah, little gestures. Yeah. Well, I wanted to ask you about Vent Haven because uh, we've talked about Vent Haven on this show before, and. You were writing letters to uh, W.S. Berger back in the 60s, um, and he was the founder of Vent Haven. What were you writing about back in those days? It was, it was a situation, I, I think I was writing from when I was in the service. I was in the service and I wrote, I wrote, I wrote him. Matter of fact, uh, they showed me a couple of letters when, I was, when we went down there to, to film things for the uh, documentary. They showed me some of the letters that, that they had on file that I, that I had written. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was just a situation because I knew uh, Vin Haven. So I just, and wanting to be a ventriloquist, I just wanted to pick, pick his brain in a way. Yeah. Well, and your, your very first Lester is now in Vin Haven in the museum. The, the, uh, let's see the medium Lester, the medium Lester is, is, he is in, he's been there for a whole bunch of, a uh, whole bunch of years. Yeah. The, uh, the, the small Lester, I don't know where, where, where that particular Lester is, <laughs> but the, the larger Lester, the one that I hang out with now it's been around for a whole bunch of years. All the te- okay. all the television shows I've done, this is the Lester. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, you also are on Ven Haven's board of advisors. Why do you think Ven Haven is such an important place? Well, it's a, it's very ventriloquism is very intriguing. It's just uh, it's, it's sort of you know, it, it, and when people go there and they they see all, all the displays and stuff like that, it's just it's very intriguing kind of situation. It's just magical to see all this. It's just these. These little characters, and they're able to be able to talk. That's sort of um, intriguing to some people. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, I've I've been to Ven Haven once, and it it really left an impression on me because <laughs> it's such an amazing place. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I read you got to meet Edgar Bergen once. Did he give you any advice when you met him? I met Edgar Bergen uh, several times. Uh, it's like um, I was in uh, Detroit, and uh, well, I was well, still. Uh, I lived in Detroit, so he was working a, a club called the Elmwood Casino across the river there in uh, Windsor, Ontario. It was a nightclub, big nightclub then, back in those days. So I saw in the paper where he was going to be there. So I I got in my car, which I took the initiative. That I got, I was bold. I took a chance. I, I wouldn't normally do this, but I took a chance. Put Lester in the trunk and drove across to the uh, Elmwood Casino and went in to see his show. And uh, after the show. It was a Wednesday. I remember it was a Wednesday. It was the middle of the week, and and it wasn't like a big crowd. It was back in the days when when, when nightclubs were going down, and uh, it wasn't a big crowd during the mid- midweek there. But it was a, it was it was a good crowd. And uh, was, after I finished after he finished, I went to the major D. I says, uh, "Could you tell me where I could see Mister Bergen?" And then the guy says, "Oh, he's right over. He's he's in that room right there, right over there, right over there." So I went over. I knocked on the door and, I, and he and he said, "Come in." And they were in there. His he and his wife were in there eating dinner. And I went, "Oh boy, Jesus. <laughs> He says he, he knew me because of the Merv Griffin show, the Mike Dudley shows. He knew who I was. 
So we talked. And then he says, um, uh, um, where's your character? I said, I got, him in the, I got him in the car. He said, bring him in, bring him in, bring him in. I went and got him and brought him in. And it's the idea he wanted to give me some pointers. So, But he gave me a great pointer. It's like a situation when Lester talked, he was animated. But he wasn't talk when he wasn't talking and I was talking, Lester wasn't animated. And he looked at me, he says, you know what you're doing wrong? He says, you got to keep him moving all the time, even though, even though he's not talking, you know, to make it look realistic, you got to keep him moving all the time. So I said, okay, cool. Very good. Very good. And then later on, we did a thing called event, event way out here in California in, in um, Santa Monica with a, uh, Steve Allen was the host. It was called the Vent Event, HBO special. And uh, Edgar Bergen was on there. Sherry Lewis was on there. Jay Johnson was on there. Uh, and a whole bunch of other venture Lucas. Yeah, and you, um, it, it all came full circle. You got to meet Paul Winchell too, right? I met, I met Paul. Let's see, I met him out here in California. And we had done, we, uh, let's see, uh, let's see. Uh, Dick Clark and Ed McMahon used to have TV's Bloopers and Blunders, a TV show. So we did a, they wanted to take four ventriloquists eating dinner at a place called Casari's. And so uh, I, uh, let's see, it's okay. I'm just looking at my notes here, I'm sorry. Um, the, so um, it was like Sherry Lewis, uh, Paul Winchell, and I can't, I cannot, you know the guy who has the cowboy with the cowboy hat? Uh, Ron Lucas? Ron Lucas, it was Ron Lucas, yeah. yeah. So it was all four of us eating dinner and uh, they had cameras there, and they wanted us to have our characters there and just talk. You know, we talked for about 30 minutes, you know, but they only put on the air about two minutes of it. But right. it's the idea that and they, they, the, the waiters were bringing food over. We couldn't eat the food because we were talking. You know, <laughs> the food looked, was great, looked great and everything, but we couldn't, we could not eat the food. And everybody was ad living. Paul Winchell was ad living, Sherry Lewis was ad living, and uh, Ron Lucas we were ad living. So it was a fun thing. It's somewhere, it's somewhere around. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's an amazing dinner to be at right there. Mm -hmm. um, well, as we wrap up here, I wanted to ask you about a documentary that you are currently involved in. It's called Hello Dummy. And um, you have the trailer up on the website, which is hello-dummy.com. Mm -hmm. And it's a really powerful trailer because it, it, this movie is about your career, but it's also about like relation, race relations of here in the United States. Well, well, yeah, that that, uh, that's, that goes pretty much goes without saying. It was like a situation where you know that particular time. That's that's the that's the way things were. You know, yeah. it's like uh, you know, as you as you live life, you know, you go through particular thing, particular situations. But it was like, uh, but again, it was like it was a situation where uh, I I would uh, perform uh, a lot of places. I would perform. Uh, it would be like black only clubs. Sometimes it'd be white only clubs. Sometimes it'd be uh, 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 we call it black and tan clubs. Black and tan clubs was a mixture, mixture of uh, people. So it's like, but it was like a situation. Where it was fun, you, you know. Mm -hmm. you, you you did it, did the show, and and you come off. The pe people enjoyed it, no matter you know what what hue they were. Right. They enjoyed right. it, and uh, we enjoyed it. Right. Well, and in in that trailer, it says that uh, you know people love the show so much. You kind of those barriers were broken down because people were dancing together. And yeah, it's, it's a situation when I was with motor town, with a motor town review and working down, down South, we were working down South and it's a situation where, uh, um, it, when the, the Motown acts got on stage and they start doing a Motown sound, people got that music in them and they didn't care about, they, they, they forget, forgot about what you're supposed to be separated or not. You know, yeah. they, they, they didn't care if they are having a good time. And so it's like, you know, we're just going to enjoy this. Yeah, yeah, and I and I think that helped the Motown shows. I think it helped a lot. Yeah, to bring everybody together. Yeah, well, I, as I said, I'm I'm very excited to see it. Have you had fun making this film? Well, yeah, yeah, it's it's, fun. Yeah. it's a lot of fun, a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. Well, Willie, as we wrap up here, I always like to ask as the final question: What has been the highlight of your career so far? Wow, I like it's a situation where I, it's, it's been so many highlights. <laughs> it's like, uh, you know, working with Sam, Sammy Davis Jr., working with Frank Sinatra, uh, and, um, uh, doing, uh, what doing laugh in that brought me out to California doing laugh in And, uh, but I remember they still rerun this one, the episode of the Jeffersons. That was fun. But it's the idea when when we went, when he got, it's a, a real quick thing. It's like sure. I was in Tahoe and, uh, 
I was still in, I'm back in Tahoe again. So I was there. <laughs> and so we were gonna, I was going to come down to, uh, don't, don't, no, I was, I was in Reno. And I was going to come down to, uh, to uh, read for the uh, Jefferson. You know, so I came down and I read for it. I mean, I, I had the show, but I came down to read the script. And the people there says, and then I was gonna fly back each night. I was gonna fl- come down. They say, you know, you can't, you can't do that. He said, we, we, we have to, you have to be here for rehearsal. He said, we can't, we can't fly back and forth like that. So anyway, I, I stayed down in L.A. My manager got all my stuff up, up in Reno and brought it down. We canceled. We, 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 we <laughs> it's strange how things work. We canceled. Was, we were with Andy Williams, you know. Oh yeah. yeah. And we canceled our, our portion of, of the show. Because it's either do this big gigantic Jeffersons episode that's being seen all over the world, or you know do that 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 one week up there. So it's like it's really strange how things work. Sometimes, some it's like when I got when I did real quick now when I did the, um, uh, the David Letterman ventriloquist week. Mm-hmm. Okay, I found out about that. I was going to do I was on a getting ready to go on a cruise ship. My publicist called me about that, and I said he says we got to you can do it Monday. I said, well, I'm gonna go on, I'm going out on the cruise ship. He says, Well, can you get can you get out of that? I said, oh, well. uh, so when it rains, it pours, in other words. So I was able to call the cruise ship people. I said, I said, I'm doing the David Letterman show. Can I can I can I can I get out of this? And they said, Oh, okay. You know, so I was able to get out of it. But it doesn't come easy sometimes. Some decisions you gotta make sometimes. It's like, wow. You know, sometimes you make the right one, sometimes you make the wrong one. Yeah, yeah. Well, you've certainly just had an amazing career. And um, Willie, I can't thank you enough for, for taking the time to talk to me today. It's my pleasure. My pleasure, Grant. Many thanks to Willie Tyler for being on the show. For links to some of the things we talked about, including the upcoming documentary, which you can find at hello-dummy.com, check out the show notes for this episode, episode number 55, over at underthepuppet.com. And special thanks to Keith Valcourt for making this interview possible. Now it's time to announce the winner of episode 54's giveaway for a prize package from UzzyWorks.com that includes an amazing practice puppet. The question was, what was the name of the five and dime store in Plainfield, Indiana, where a young John Kennedy used to go to try and find puppet building supplies? And the answer was Danner's. And the winner is Will Carroll. Congratulations, Will. Your UzzyWorks prize package is on the way. I want to give a special thanks to UzzyWorks.com for supporting the show with a giveaway. UzzyWorks designs company logos, draws caricature portraits, character designs, and creates puppet characters for both the UzzyWorks YouTube channel and as commissioned works. For more information about UzzyWorks, visit UzzyWorks.com. That's U-Z-Z-Y-W-O-R-K-S dot com. Now, you know, since we had such a great response to the Uzzy Works practice puppet giveaway, I figured we should give another puppet away. Back in episode 41, we interviewed David Stevens. And if you've been following his Instagram page, and you really should be, you know that he's created a hilarious series of wood and string puppets called the Dowlings. So this episode, we are giving away an under the puppet custom Dowling handmade by David Stevens. To see a picture of this one-of-a-kind Dowling, visit the show notes for this episode, episode number 55, over at underthepuppet.com. To be entered to win the Under the Puppet Dowling, you just have to find the answer to this question from the episode you just heard. Who was Willie Tyler opening for when Lester's body got misdirected by the airline company? When you find the answer, send it in an email to underthepuppet at gmail.com with the subject line giveaway and you'll be entered to win. All entries for this giveaway must be received by January 15th, 2021. The winner will be chosen at random from all correct entries and be announced on the February 1st, 2021 episode of the show. One entry per household. Good luck. Well, that's going to do it for this episode of Under the Puppet. If you have questions, suggestions, or feedback about the show, call our voicemail line at 818-806-9604 or click the Call the Show button in the free Under the Puppet app for iOS and Android. You can also send your feedback via email to underthepuppet at gmail.com, or you can connect with the show on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram by searching for Under the Puppet. And don't forget to tell a friend about the show. Thank you so much for listening. This episode of Under the Puppet was edited by Stephen Staber and features music by Dan Ring. Under the Puppet is a production of Saturday Morning Media and made possible by the Saturday Morning Media Patreon patrons who've gone to patreon.com forward slash Saturday Morning Media and set up a monthly pledge for as little as a dollar a month. 
Patrons get new episodes before they are released, behind the scenes information, and exclusive bonus episodes. If you'd like to support this show and the other fun content from Saturday Morning Media, become a patron. Head on over to patreon.com forward slash Saturday Morning Media and set up your monthly pledge today. You can also tell a friend about the show or leave the show a review on Apple Podcasts. Thank you so much for listening. Under the Puppet is copyright 2020 Saturday Morning Media Grant Pachoco Executive Producer. All rights reserved. www.saturdaymorningmedia.com Under the Puppet proudly presents the adventures of Timmy the Tooth Reunion. In this almost 90-minute video, you will hear great stories from the cast and crew who brought this amazing puppet show to life. Plus, you'll see never-before-seen artwork and exclusive behind-the-scenes video. Under the Puppet's Timmy the Tooth Reunion is available right now at timmy.underthepuppet.com. You've been listening to Saturday Morning Media. Stay tuned. We'll be right back.